Well, the 2019 NASCAR playoffs have begun, and already there is, well, tension boiling over, if I may say so myself. Let's get into it. This is The Fuel. What's happening ladies and germs, this is the Packer Man, and welcome to today's edition of The Fuel. Um, today we are going to be reviewing the first race of the 2019 NASCAR Monster Energy Cup Series Playoffs. Uh, the South Point 400 at Las Vegas. Uh, Las Vegas' first ever day to night race in the Cup Series. So, how was this race? Um, it wasn't the best. Uh, I personally think that the spring race was better. But I'll tell you one damn thing. It was miles better than that piece of shit race we called the Brickyard 400 last week. By a country mile. And yet there's some people like, oh, this race wasn't that good. You know, keep pretending that, you know, that you think that this race is good. Oh, well, I'm sorry that, you know, I have different standards than you. Okay, if I think a race is good, then I say it's fucking good. If I think a race is garbage, then I say it's fucking garbage. At least with me, you get my full, honest opinion. No frills, no bullshit. As my hat seems to be a little askew. There we go. But um, before we get into the South Point 400, it's time for uh, the news of the week. So let's run through it. In what was a very surprising poll by Jeff Gluck, I believe. Um, this is something that he's been doing on a weekly basis for a while now. Um, basically, he put up a poll saying, was the Indianapolis race any good? A mind-boggling 64% said that the race was good. Even though there were zero pure lead changes, it was pretty much a freight train throughout the entire race, and there were nine freaking caution flags to slow the action down. I mean, even Eric Eastep gave it a 70% which just confuses the hell out of me. So, why was it that the Brickyard 400 was given a positive rating by the fan base? There's only two reasons that I can think of. One, some of the people who voted said it was a good race because of the crashes, which, and I've said this before, Honestly, if you think a race is good because of the crashes, you're watching the wrong fucking sport, son. Go watch figure eight racing or demolition derby if you like that kind of shit. Okay, some of us prefer to watch NASCAR for the fucking racing, not for the crashes. But I think the second reason might be more plausible. Which again, kind of plays into my point of what's the fucking point of even caring. Um, I think a lot of people thought that the race was good because of the playoff implications of the final two guys who will get into the playoff. Meaning, you know, Clint Boyer who got in in the 15th position and Ryan Newman who made it into the playoff in the 16th and final spot. Which begs the question, who the fuck honestly thinks that these two have a chance to win the championship? I mean, if you honestly believe these two have any semblance of a snowball's chance in hell of winning this championship, then you seriously need to get off the fucking LSD. Because you are tripping balls. I mean, they have not been anywhere near consistent enough 
to even be considered a championship threat. I mean, look at Clint Boyer in this race, for example. He started on the frickin' pole for the South Point 400. He didn't even finish in the top 10 at the end of stage one. Didn't finish in the top 10 at the end of stage two. He was a non-factor for pretty much the entire damn race. And Ryan Newman, he was able to finish 10th, but just to give you an idea of how, you know, he hasn't been scoring that many points to even be considered a threat for the championship, he's still six points uh, out of 12th, which is the cut line. So, I mean, ultimately, I mean, who fucking cares about, you know, the final playoff spot that happened, you know, at Indianapolis. It's ultimately not going to go anywhere anyway. So why the fuck is anybody even, you know, investing their time in it? They're going to be lucky to make it out of the first round. You know, and I said as much last week, and lo and behold, after one fucking race, both Clint Boyer and Ryan Newman are below the cut line. Now, granted, Newman's only six points back, but still... Six points is six points. And the point still stands. He's still below the cut line. Now, he could work his way back into that. But we'll have to take a wait and see approach. But regardless if he makes it to the round of 12 or not, he's not winning the damn championship. So ultimately, you know, caring about the race for the final two playoff spots is ultimately fucking pointless. Because it's not going to go anywhere. These two are not winning the championship, and I'm not going to waste my fucking time caring that they're going to win the championship or not. Because it's not going to happen. Okay? If these two are 15th and 16th in the point standings, you know, let's, let's put this into perspective. Okay? Alright, let's say it was a 10 race regular season, and then, you know, you go into the playoff and everything. You know, and these guys were 15th and 16th in points after 10 races then okay maybe they're just having you know a little bit of an off season you know but they still have some time to you know right the ship when you're 15th and 16th in points after 26 races you're not winning the damn championship and that's under the new format and the old format of all the races counting towards the championship Okay, 26 races. That's more than pretty much any other racing series in the world. You know, and we still have 10 more races to determine the champion. I mean, NASCAR has by far the longest schedule in the world as far as motorsports is concerned. You know, and you honestly think that Clint Boyer and Ryan Newman have a snowball's chance in hell of winning this championship when they could barely even get into the top 15 after 26 races. Come off the bullshit, people. It's not going to happen. Stop trying to pretend that it will. I mean, I know that's a very negative outlook, but you know what? You know, I mean, the numbers don't lie, people. I mean, they have been nowhere near consistent enough to be considered a threat. I mean, Clint Boyer started on the pole, for God's sake, and he was a non-factor by the end of Stage 1. What does that tell you? So stop with the bullshit, people. These two are going to be non-factors for the championship at the very latest by the end of the round of 12. But like I said, they'll be lucky to get out of the round of 16. But I don't see them going any farther than the round of 12, and that's it. You know, I'm sorry that I have, you know, a realistic expectation for them. I don't see them getting any farther than that. Uh, moving that aside, um, there's a bit of sad news that kind of broke in the middle of this race last night and uh, kind of sucks um, because it's a guy who should be in the NASCAR Hall of Fame and for some reason isn't 
uh, Mike Stefanik, a seven-time NASCAR modified champion and two-time Canaan Pro East Series champion, uh, passed away uh, last night at around 6.41 p.m. Uh, at, the, at the age of 61 after being involved in an airplane crash. Um, he was conscious when they put him into uh, the ambulance, but um, he had suffered uh, significant injuries and also suffered from uh, fire inhalation and uh, was pronounced dead at 6.41 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. That kind of sucks. Because, I mean, he's accomplished things, you know, in the modified division that not very many other people can really, you know, come close to. Maybe Richie Evans. Of course, a lot of people consider Richie Evans, you know, the greatest modified driver of all time. You know, and Mike Stefanik is uh, right there with him, as far as I'm concerned. So, um, this was definitely... Uh, a very big bummer and you know, another blow in the motorsports world you know after uh, the untimely passing of a uh, and um, of uh, Hubert a couple weeks ago and now we have uh, Mike Stefanik you know passing on from uh, an airplane crash unfortunately and of course that just flashes back to what happened to Dale Jr at Bristol about a month ago it sucks man so uh, he was 61 years old I mean he honestly th honestly he had s some more years in front of him you know it sucks uh, may he rest in peace um, moving on to some news that kind of came out of left field Paul Menard announced his retirement from the Cup Series, from full-time competition in the Cup Series, at the end of 2019. I mean, there was no prelude to it, nothing whatsoever. And uh, he said, uh, I'm going to uh, announce my retirement from the Cup Series uh, at the end of the year, after over a decade uh, in the Cup Series. Now, while Paul Menard is certainly not had a career that's Hall of Fame worthy. I mean, he only has the one career win. Um, he's had what I would call a serviceable career for someone who is pretty much known as a pay driver. I mean, he's the son of John Menard, one of the richest men on the planet because of his hardware store juggernaut Menards. Save big money at Menards. You know, that whole thing. But uh, Paul Menard still does have that one win, and it was the Brickyard 400, so that was a really big deal for him. And uh, he's decided that he's going to be retiring uh, from the Cup Series at the end of the season. So, um, the Wood Brothers team was like, well, who should we get to uh, replace you at the end of the season? And immediately Paul Menard said, Matt Benedetto." Yeah, De Benedetto's performance at Bristol caught some people's attention. Especially Paul Menard, who said, you need to get Matt. And of course, he's referring to Matt De Benedetto uh, to drive the 21 car. And they formally announced it, I think it was this week, a couple of days before the Las Vegas race, I think, they announced it. And um, that's great, because Matt De Benedetto has more than proven his worth in what is essentially, you know, lower tier equipment. You know, now he's going to get a shot in a car that's actually pretty decent. You know, it's basically a pseudo Penske team because they're getting uh, Penske support. And the 20, the 21 team has actually done pretty decently this year, all things considered. So having Matt De Benedetto on board, I think that's going to be a big boost for the Wood Brothers next year. And kudos to uh, Paul Menard uh, for doing that. And that will do it for uh, the news of the week. So, let's go ahead and get into the race review. The, the um, South Point 400 
at Las Vegas. All right, so the stages broke down like this for the race. Uh, stages one and two were 80 laps. Uh, stage three, 107 laps. Now, the previous race here at Las Vegas went caution free, because I, again, I don't count the stage breaks. Um, will it happen again? Well, almost, not quite. Uh, but let's get into it. Stage one, Clint Boyer starts from the pole. Uh, Boyer leads lap number one, but Daniel Suarez, his teammate, uh, was racing him hard and sets uh, and gets the lead on the next lap. Uh, and we had our first pure lead change uh, on lap number two. Would not be the last one, I promise you. Um, but early on here in stage one, um, the SHR cars were up inside the top five, and they were saying they were really trimmed out, meaning that uh, they didn't have a whole lot of downforce. But at the front of the field, that you know they had an advantage. Uh, Kyle Busch uh, brushes the wall off of turn two very early on and uh, he has to make an emergency stop uh, for a cut right rear tire from the damage which really put him behind the eight ball uh, very early on and uh, his day would see you know <laughs> up and down kind of day uh, Almarola gets by Voyeur for second um, Joey Logano had a really strong car uh, here in this first stage. I mean, he started, I think it was like either 18th or 24th. He was mid-pack uh, to start this race, and he was coming in a hurry. I mean, he had a dynamite car in this first stage. Uh, Harvick and Logano get by Boyer for uh, third and fourth. Logano blows right by Harvick for third. And then NBCSN basically, um, when there's a three car fight for the lead getting ready to develop between uh, Suarez, Almarola, and Logano, they're all three right there together. NBCSN decides to go to a fucking commercial. Like, are you kidding me? Are you serious? We're getting ready to see a three car fight for the lead and they go to a fucking commercial. Like, that is some stupid bullshit, man. I mean, I've gotten on Fox for doing that shit, and now NBCSN is doing it. You know, when they could have gone to side-by-side -side at that point, knowing that there was a three-car battle for the lead developing? <sighs> Fucking ridiculous. So after this terribly timed commercial break, um, they show Logano already in the fucking lead, because of course he is. And they completely missed two pure lead changes at that point. Almirola managed to get around Suarez for the lead on lap 30. Uh, and then three laps later, Joe Logano got by Almirola for the lead himself on lap 33 for a third pure lead change. So that's two lead changes that we missed because NBCSN decided to go to a fucking commercial. Fucking idiot. I mean, you want to get people to watch, you know, NASCAR on your freaking channel, but, you know, you, your timing of your commercials is just fucking garbage. It's ridiculous, man. Nobody likes fucking commercials, especially, you know, when something interesting is getting ready to develop. Talk about some... A lack of spatial awareness right there. Anyway, green flag pit stops begin on lap 41. Uh, Logano pits from the lead on lap 43. Uh, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. has to make an unscheduled stop for a cut right rear tire after getting into the wall, which was a common theme. Oh, by the way, <laughs> you know, I've been ragging on Ryan Newman after what happened at Bristol, but uh, at least he made it into the playoff for what that's worth. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. just signed a two-year contract extension and didn't even finish in the top 20 at the end of the regular season. Good job, Roush Fenway Racing. Good job on that re-signing. Fucking idiots. Uh, Michael McDowell finally pits from the lead on lap 60 after staying out. Uh, Joey Logano cycles back for, with the lead, and that's basically how it would stay for the remainder of the stage. Uh, Harvick gets by Almarola for second after the 10 gets really loose in turn one. 
Um, some cars had one of them um, temperature gauges behind the driver's seat and uh, temps in the cars were at 140 degrees. Uh, just to put, put that into, into perspective, water boils at 120 degrees and it's 140 degrees inside these race cars. I'm talking 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, that is hot enough to boil water. And that's what these drivers, you know, have to uh, deal with inside these race cars. Now, granted they have, you know, the air conditioned suit and the helmet and all that stuff. But uh, just imagine what they have to go through um, if they didn't have that. I mean, Dale Jr. said a long time ago, um, before they had all the air conditioned suits and stuff, uh, with the temperatures as hot as they were and as much as, you know, they were sweating as much as they were, uh, he said they would lose 8 to 10 pounds a race. They, uh, like 8 to 10 pounds of, you know, fat and shit. Of their body weight because, you know, of how hard they're working inside the race cars and how freaking hot it is. And uh, Clint Boyer at this point is back to the 14th position after starting on the pole. And Joey Logano wins stage number one by like seven seconds. Yeah, the second half of this stage sucked. I mean, after they came back from commercial, after Joey Logano had already taken the lead, nothing else of salient value happened at the end of the stage. Stage one fucking sucked. Uh, everyone comes in for service and Harvick wins the race off pit road. So Harvick leads the start of stage number two. William Byron takes the lead on the restart, but it doesn't count as a pure lead change because it's on the restart. Uh, Logano takes it the next lap, though, for a fourth pure lead change on lap 88. Uh, Harvick starts to quickly lose spots and is now back to seventh, so that, you know, trimmed out car is starting to um, show its uh, weaknesses. Um, but also on this uh, restart, Eric Jones had a transmission issue from the look of it, from the look, from what they were uh, saying. Uh, he couldn't get it out of second gear. Uh, so that puts him behind the wall. <clears throat> so basically the second straight year that he's made the playoff and the second straight year that he's had mechanical issues. Uh, Chase Elliott gets up to fifth early in stage two. Uh, Kyle Larson was actually uh, pretty good in this race early on. I uh, guess by Almarola for third on the outside. Uh, and then Chase Elliott gets by Omarola for fourth, and then by Larson for third as Larson gets loose in turn three. Um, Martin Truex Jr. would start making his way back toward the front after losing spots on pit road. Um, he actually dropped back to 18th on the restart, which is actually kind of crazy considering the fact that uh, did he restart 18th at, at the beginning of the stage? I guess yeah, I think he did, and he had a fast car in the. Uh, that was coming alive at this point. Uh, Elliott gets by uh, William Byron for second and is only 1.4 seconds behind Logano. Uh, so Logano's advantage was starting to slip a little bit. Truex gets by Almarola for fifth. Uh, and then Larson and Truex get by Byron for third and fourth. Then we have a great battle for second between Elliott, Truex, and Larson. Uh, Truex winning out at this point. Uh, Kurt Busch kicks off green flag stops on lap 122. Uh, Logano pits from the lead on lap 124 and he cycles back with the lead. Uh, Elliott regains second from Truex on the pit stops. And uh, Elliott and Truex begin catching Logano for the race lead. Uh, Truex gets back by Elliott for second and starts quickly closing in on Logano uh, to challenge him for the race lead. Kyle Larson gets by uh, Elliott for third. Uh, and then Logano gets stuck behind the number 77 car. I can't remember who it was that was driving it at, at the time and it allows Truex to take, take the lead on the outside uh, for a fifth pure lead change on lap 158 and MTJ wins stage number two after the late pass of Logano. Uh, fun fact that they came out with uh, at this point ever since the stages uh, were introduced um, the winner of stage two would go on to win the race every single time Hmm, foreshadowing a little bit. Uh, everyone comes in for service, and Martin Truex Jr. wins the race off pit road this time. Uh, the first couple of times, uh, the 19 pit crew wasn't really on it. Uh, this time, they were. 
Uh, Kyle Larson gets penalized for too many men over the wall when one of his pit crew guys was trying to grab one of the um, tires and he, near, and he basically almost fell over the wall. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. Wasn't really funny for the 42 team since he had to restart at the tail end of the field. Uh, MTJ leads the start of stage number three. Uh, Logano leads the lap on the restart, but Trix regains it on the next lap. They were basically side by side for most of that time. So we had our six pure lead change on lap 169. Then we had three wide for second between Logano, Harvick, and Elliott, with Elliott winning out. And uh, Chase Elliott would actually run down Truex and get by him for the race lead, our seventh pure lead change on lap 171. Uh, Byron uh, gets a left rear tire rub after what was very slight contact with Ryan Blaney. I mean, it, it was it didn't even look that hard, but it was enough to put a kink um, at the left in the left rear fender. Uh, Logano gets by Truex for second, and Truex actually ends up falling back to fifth because his car was way loose uh, at this point of the run. Um, Alex Bowman makes his appearance in the top five, up to fourth. And then we get our first caution of the race on lap 181. The first caution at Las Vegas in six stages, basically, because uh, the March race was caution free. The first two stages here were caution free. Uh, and then we finally have our first uh, caution on lap 181. Byron loses the left rear tire after the fender cuts into it, uh, but he's able to make it a pit to pit road, get his tire, get his left rear, get, excuse me get his left side tires changed and got back off um, uh, before uh, the leader got back around, which was Elliott at the time. And Logano basically tried to <laughs> uh, pull one over on the Hendrick guys because Chase uh, slowed down on the caution, which allowed um, Byron to get back, you know, to keep from going a lap down. Logano tried to pass uh, Elliott um, because, you know, he basically tried to say, well, he's not maintaining his position and he wanted to keep Byron a lap down. Uh, NASCAR wasn't going to allow that. I'll tell you that much. Uh, everyone comes in for service. Uh, Hamlin, Suarez, Newman, and Blaney take just two tires. Uh-oh. <laughs> so Hamlin leads on the restart. And that restart was absolutely bonkers. I was like, how the hell that we did not have a big crash on that one? Hamlin slides up uh, in the turn, allowing Blaney to get by on the outside. Um, but as it turned out, Blaney had led the lap after the restart. Uh, managed to take the lead. But then Harvick passed them both on the back stretch and led the lap. So we had our eighth pure lead change on lap 187. And then we had our second caution. And why did that pop up? That's weird. My bandit cam popped up. <laughs> then we had our second caution on lap 187. Kurt Busch loses the left uh, left front tire uh, after contact with Martin Truex Jr. when they try to go four wide in the turn one and hits the turn three wall hard. The ironic thing is he was com probably coming to pit road at that time, but the left rear tire just basically went flat on him, which sucks for him because you know that basically puts him in a hole. Uh, as far as the uh, playoff is concerned. So Chase Elliott leads half the field down for service. As it turned out, Logano had sustained front end damage after contact uh, with 37 and I think with Daniel Suarez as well um, when he tried to basically duck to the inside and he got a lot of front end damage. And he was not real happy with Suarez either. Um, oh, and Kyle Busch gets back on the lead lap at this point because of this caution with fresh tires. Uh-oh. Um, so Harvick leads on the restart. Uh, Truex goes around the outside of Blaney and Newman for second. Basically went three wide with the both of them. Uh, Boyer gets a tire rub on his car after hard contact with Paul Menard uh, and has to pit for repairs. So, you know, that pretty much puts him in a hole. Elliott storms back towards the front on the fresh tires. Uh, Keselowski, whose name hasn't been called all that much in this review, Gets by Bowman for fourth. Uh, Harvick two seconds ahead with 60 laps to go. Kyle Busch is already back up to seventh with 50 to go. That gives you any indication. 
Uh, Keselowski moves up to third. We have a great battle for fourth between Blaney, Elliott, and Bowman. And uh, Hamlin started dropping back because he had a possible equalized tire. And what that means is um, on fast tracks like this, they run an inner liner. So just in case a tire uh, goes down on, goes flat, uh, it'll go down onto the inner liner. Uh, and even though you have to run at reduced speed, at least it'll keep the tire from coming apart for the most part. But uh, it had the same, but the inner liner had basically almost the same air pressure uh, as the um, tire itself, which is um, not good. It makes the car handle really weird. And uh, Hamlin was basically dropping back because of that. Ryan Newman kicks off the final round of green flag pit stops on lap 229. Harvick pits from the lead on lap 231. Byron gets just a two tire change on his stop. Uh, Truex managed to gain back a lot of the gap on Kevin Harvick. Uh, De Benedetto stays out the longest, uh, but finally comes to pit road on lap 247. Harvick cycles back with the lead, but it did not last long because Truex got a great run on Harvick on the outside, uh, coming off of turn two and just basically blows right by him. For the race winning pass for the lead, our ninth pure lead change on lap 248. And Truex just says, see ya. And that was basically the last we would see of that. Uh, but then <laughs> some fireworks started to go off here when uh, Kyle Busch plows into the back of the lap car of uh, Garrett Smithley, I believe his name is, which bowed up the right front of the car um, and basically made it almost undrivable. And uh, Kyle Busch after the race was not very complimentary of the lap car saying, you know, we got guys that haven't even won late model races driving in the Cup Series. Uh, Garrett Smithley basically started hitting back at him, saying shit like, um, um, well, he, you know, he has never had to be in the position that, you know, I've been in, basically born with a silver spoon in his mouth, which is bullshit because uh, the Bush family before Kurt and Kyle's success, uh, they were not the richest family in the world. You know what Kurt's um, occupation was before he became a su successful race car driver? He was working in a supermarket. No joke. He was working in a supermarket before he found his calling as a race car driver. So saying that Kyle Bush has no idea, you know, what he's been through are you fucking serious dude they both had to go through legends cars and shit to get their start in the racing world and they didn't have the financial backing that some of these other drivers who are coming up into the series have they had to basically earn their keep you know so and not only that Garrett you know, he said, well, you know, I held my line, and that's true, but the other side of that coin is, your car is a fucking moving chicane. So, while you did hold your line, you held your line in the middle of the fucking racetrack. You know, and Chris Busher had an analogy that was basically like, you know, imagine, you know, somebody running into the back of someone at a red light because they were stopped at a red light. Which is one of the dumbest analogies that I've ever heard because last time I checked, the 52 car was not at a dead stop. So, Chris Busher, you know, I definitely think that you're more talented than your equipment is allowing you to show. But come on, dude. That was a dumb take. So, I don't blame Kyle Busch for being a little bit irritated there. But I certainly didn't agree with him lashing out at the media for basically just trying to do their job. I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe some of the questions were dumb, but there was really no need to lash out at them like that. So, you know, I don't agree with Kyle Busch doing that shit either. So, that's just how I feel about that. But uh, that was pretty much all she wrote from there on, though. And Martin Truex Jr. wins the South Point 400 at Las Vegas. 
uh, for his fifth win of the season, the 24th of his career, and punches his ticket to the round of 12. Which he's done the last three, three of the last four uh, openers for the playoff. Hmm. So, your top 10 finishers, Martin Truex Jr. started 24th and goes to victory lane, uh, led 32 laps, so he gets six playoff points, so that adds on to his total that he got from the regular season. Again, playoff points carried throughout the playoff. Uh, Harvick, despite leading 47 laps, ends up second. Uh, Brad Keselowski, early in this race, was dog meat. I mean, in the second stage, he was languishing around 20th, um, which, just, which necessitated the team to raise the hood and basically make some adjustments to, like, the springs and shit like that. But uh, whatever they did worked because he, he was able to come back for a third place finish. Uh, Chase Elliott comes home fourth. Ryan Blaney in fifth. I believe these are all playoff drivers. Indeed, indeed it is. Uh, Ryan Blaney in fifth. Alex Bowman in sixth. Um, he only had, since his victory at Chicagoland, he only had one top ten finish and that was at Michigan. But uh, finally gets back into the top ten at the best possible time. Uh, William Byron in seventh. Nice comeback after having a flat tire. Uh, Kyle Larson in eighth. Joey Logano led 105 laps in this race, but winds up ninth after receiving damage in uh, stage, I think it was in the middle of stage three. And then Ryan Newman manages a 10th place finish. He's still six points out uh, on the cutoff line, but uh, I will give him credit where to do. He did manage the top 10 finish. Speaking of the points, after uh, the first race in the round of 16, two more to go. Uh, Martin Truex Jr., of course, punches his ticket, and he did pass inspection. So the win is good, and moves on to the round of 12. Kevin Harvick, a uh, second, 52 above. Joey Logano, uh, Kyle Busch, um, Brad Keselowski in the top five. Then you have Chase Elliott, Denny Hamlin, Kyle Larson, William Byron, and Ryan Blaney in the top 10. Uh, Alex Bowman is 10 above, and Eric Amarola is 6 above. The four drivers in the danger zone, Ryan Newman in 13th, minus 6. Kurt Busch in 14th, minus 14. Clint Boyer in 15th, minus 21. And Eric Jones in 16th, minus 26. 26, that's a lot of points. That's nearly half the total that you could get in a race. So, I mean... Clint Boyer and Eric Jones, I mean, that's almost must-win territory for them in one race. Um, and there's Richmond and, of course, the Charlotte Road Course yet to come. Um, as for my final rating for the um, South Point 400 at Las Vegas, um, was this race as good as the one back in March? No. Uh, I mean, the second half of Stage 1 was mind-numbingly boring but overall it wasn't that bad I mean it was a pretty solid race all things considered and we had nine pure lead changes you know so for those that are saying oh you know the race wasn't that interesting you know I guess you know nine passes for nine legit passes for the lead um, just doesn't matter I guess so I will give this race a solid 6 out of 10. That's what I'll give it. Um, definitely not the best race of all time, but it was shit tons better than the Brickyard 400. I'll tell you that much. But uh, that's going to do it uh, for this week's edition of The Fuel. Next week, it's the IndyCar finale. Um, of course, we'll have the Cup race at Richmond on Saturday night. So I won't have to split my attention between two races again. And then Sunday afternoon, it's the championship finale for the NTT IndyCar Series at Laguna Seca. Four guys competing for the championship there. And we'll, <laughs> we'll certainly wait and see what happens, especially since they haven't been at Laguna Seca in quite some time. So looking forward to that. But that'll come next week. So until then, thank you very much for watching. And this has been the Packer Man, and I am signing out. Bye-bye. Well, that is all for today's video. Thank you very much for watching. Be sure to rate, comment, favorite, like, 
and subscribe to my channels here on YouTube.com and over on BitChute.com. If you would like to sponsor my channel, go to my channel page at Subscribestar.com. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, this is the Packer Man, signing out. Have a good one.